Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Welcome to Mando Lessons Live. My name is Baron Collins Hill. I hope you are all doing well. Got people from all over. Let us know. Us. Let me know. Or us, yeah. And there's all sorts of people in the chat, so let everybody know where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from Portland, Oregon. Um, and we got folks already in the chat. Sorry for the little mix-up on the timing. I hit the wrong button. But it looks like we're all here. Always read the, uh, the little splash screen. It's not going to happen on a Friday night at 8 p.m. or whatever. So uh, my bad there. It's always Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But we got folks from British Columbia, Michigan, doo -doo -doo, Georgia, Jigs in 6-8 time, right-hand direction, can do that. Uh, Minnesota, Evansville, Indiana, London, Plymouth, Mass, Pennsylvania, California, New Jersey. Ah, one of my favorite towns. I just love the way this rolls off my tongue. Defiance, Ohio. <laughs> I, just, I love I love that just those words go together so nicely. Uh, Chile, very cool. Canada. Uh, London, Michigan, Belfast, Netherlands. Awesome. Oh no, you're in a good place. Don't worry. It's not too advanced. Uh, you're you're in a great spot. Happy to have you. No qu uh, I'll, I'll kind of give my spiel in a second once I figure out where everybody's coming from. Texas. PHL. Is that Philadelphia? I don't know. I don't know PHL. But uh, Wales. Very cool. Ontario. Nashville, Tennessee. Indianapolis. Washington State. Very cool. New Jersey. All sorts of folks. All right. Well, welcome Thanks everybody for showing up. Great to see you all here. This is Mando Lessons Live. It happens every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Most Saturdays, because it's been a couple weeks. But that tune that I started out with is uh, Shebeg Shamor. Um, a great tune that we're going to jam around on. A jam along with at the end of the, end of the hour. Having trouble talking. I, only had a I ran out of coffee, so I had a small cup of coffee this morning. And I've moved on to tea. So I'm gonna make it hard to keep my brain going, but uh, yeah, the way these work is it's just pretty much an open-ended question and answer session for anything anyone's working on. Uh, questions you have about playing tunes or playing the mandolin or music in general, all that kind of stuff. Happy to do my best to answer. Uh, also happy to play requests if people have tunes they really want to hear, as long as it's in the public domain, no copyrighted material or anything like that. Uh, no question is too advanced, no question is too simple, so, you know, everything is good, no matter where you're at, I think you can get something out of this hour, it's a great way to ask questions, I'm sure you're not the only one with the question uh, in your head, you might just be the only one that's going to put it out there, so, don't be bashful. More folks tuning in, we've got Fort Worth, Canada, Philadelphia, New York, Georgia, hey Becky, uh... Too much talking. <laughs> well, what would you like me to do? You got a question? Uh, do I still have the Eastman Octave? I do not. Uh, I did have it briefly. Uh, suggestions if you don't have it anymore. I'd be happy to talk about why you choose to pass it on. Yeah, so I had an Eastman Octave mandolin. I have a lot of instruments. I just don't play all that much octave mandolin. Um... So, I just wasn't really using it. Um, I, I play a lot of bazooki, so I have a tendency more towards like flat top instruments. Like uh, this thing, the flat top, flat back, more accompaniment style. It's a little different sound. I do love, part of my reason for getting rid of the, uh, getting rid of the, the Eastman was mostly I was moving across the country and was kind of thinning down the herd. Clearly it's they've snuck back in while I've been on the west coast. But I'll probably end up with an octave mandolin again. And it's really, I don't have any suggestions in that price range better than that Eastman. That's a great, great value, you know, for, what is it, 700 bucks new for a carved top and back A-style octave mandolin. Whew, hard to go wrong. All right, so 
Let's get some questions going. I had a question about 6-8 time on uh, pick direction. So I've got in-depth lessons on this that are always free and available on my YouTube channel and mandolessons.com, but I also will go over it now. So the, the basic pattern for your right hand in a jig is down, up, down, down, up, and I'm on the A string, up, down, down, up, down. So it's a set of three notes, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. One, two, three, one, two, three. And by doing that down, up, down, down, up, down pattern, you always have a nice downstroke every third straight, every third note, third eighth note. So we have. So that's the pattern. Your hand's gonna do that the whole time. Uh, I know David Benedict just did a great uh, live stream earlier about uh, a lot of right hand stuff and was going over that sort of down up, down up, down up, down up master pattern for uh, reels. Um, but for jigs, it's down up, down up, down up. And the way what that does is it really kind of, in the same way that with a reel where you want like, it allows you to like kind of stomp your foot. You know, you got down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. You get that nice heavy downbeat. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. If you do that for a jig, the beat you want with a jig is jiggity, 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 jig, a, a strong beat every third note, assuming all eighth notes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, with a strong beat on the one and four. Now, if you do down, up, down, up with a jig, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you have to have a strong upbeat, which isn't the end of the world, but your downstrokes are going to be naturally stronger, give a little more natural kind of swing and lift to the tune. So if you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. That's going to sort of put things off, off kilter a little bit. And so uh, James actually just guessed what I was about to do. Um, it's great to, you know, I never want uh, pick direction to get in the way of learning a tune you're excited about. So if you want to learn a jig and you're all fired up to learn it, don't let playing incorrect pick direction stop you from playing, from like getting into a tune. Just do it. Do it wrong. You know, get the notes into your head and into your fingers. You can always go back and adjust later, which is exactly what I did. Um, I learned a ton of jigs because I love the sound of them. I had no idea what I was doing with my right hand. And yeah, I could have spent a lot of time down, up, down, down, up, down, and maybe gotten it, but I was self-taught. I didn't really know what I was doing. So don't, don't let a lack of information, and this is, <laughs> this is honestly advice that I should take myself. Don't let a lack of information or like a need to get it right, right off the bat, uh, inhibit you from just trying stuff. Um... So, you know, in, in this case, we got Jig of Slurs. Uh, or, uh, what I was going to say is James suggested Jig of Slurs, which is the tune that I used to get my right hand back in position. So I knew a bunch of jigs. My pick direction was a mess. I picked one and really just played it slow. You know, so I was playing Jig of Slurs. Uh, down, up, down, up, down, up. A little mushy. Doesn't really have a whole lot of dynamics. 
gets a little awkward sometimes. It's a jig, but it's very like... It doesn't have that kind of... That groove that the jigs really have. And you can do it by putting in stronger upbeats, but it's a little awkward. And it feels really awkward. I was just watching, by the way, if you don't watch David Benedict's live stream on Saturday mornings before mine, totally check those out. He's, he had a bunch of great stuff. And uh, one of the things he was saying was, as a practice, you can, like, once you have a really good right hand pick direction technique, try to break it just for the sake of kind of, um, you know, flexibility on the instrument. So, you know, with down, up, down, up, he was saying make everything up, down, up, down. So like, he was using St. Andreal. And it's really hard. And you can use it, but it, it kind of gets rid of that drive. And the same thing is happening with jigs. So I took Jig of Slurs that was kind of sounding like this. And it's just kind of a little flat sounding. And I slowed it way down and went to down, up, down, down, up. You can start out just by kind of overemphasizing that, go through all the strings, just play drums essentially with down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, 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 up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down. And just by going super slow, I was doing it much slower than that, but for the sake of kind of explaining, uh, I was doing it a little faster than I started with. And it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be weird, you're going to really need to kind of muscle through it if you have some kind of bad pick direction techniques going on. But uh, once you get it, just in the same way you might be used to down up, down up for reels, and it's just like, oh yeah, my hand just does it, you know? It's, it's just kind of a, a mode that my right hand gets into. You can do the same thing with jigs. Down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. And after a while, you stop thinking down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. And you end up just like, oh, it's, it's the jig thing. My right hand goes into jig mode. And, you know, you had to muscle through it on the first couple tunes, but then eventually it just becomes second nature. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to get under your fingers. It can be a little frustrating but keep at it, and at some point it'll just click. You know, just keep working with it, and it'll click, and then from then on out, it'll just be part of how you learn a tune. You know, you won't have to, you really won't have to think about it ever again in a lot of ways, except for very kind of specific circumstances that don't come up all that often. All right, let's so catch other things. Can you talk about pinky playing and exercising together the seventh fret? Great question. My favorite pinky exercises are, and playing above the seventh fret, and you know, just like all this stuff. Uh, one of my favorite ones is kind of half um, pinky exercise and half just kind of good left hand technique. Um, you know, go through my beginner series, and the first le uh, lesson is really about. I got something on my microphone. Uh, like getting proper, like technique and your whole like upper body in order to play the mandolin the most comfortable as comfortably as you can but then um going through all of that if you can get to the point where you can have your first finger on the second fret and your uh pinky on the seventh fret without moving your thumb too much on all strings that means your hand is generally in a good position. So you don't need to be doing like... And shifting to get your pinky onto that 7th fret. So 2's and 7's frets with your pointer and pinky. And if you can get all the way across the fingerboard without having to move your hand around, that's a good home position for your, your whole hand to be in.
and it'll feel a little awkward at times so don't you know don't sit down and do that for 15 minutes straight do it for 60 seconds every time you pick up the instrument and then make sure to like kind of shake it out and stretch it out after you do it don't uh don't overdo anything that feels uncomfortable just do it little bits at a time regularly And then uh, some great pinky exercises are the FFCP uh, exercises on jazzmando.com. stands for four finger closed position scales, and they sound like this. So that's a closed A scale. And then the FFCP PDFs, that's a lot of letters, uh, take you through some cool scale exercises. <laughs> been a little while you know arpeggios little scale patterns all that sorts of stuff again it's really left hand intensive so don't do it for an hour straight just do a little bit and make sure to stretch out and take breaks a lot and that will get your pinky into shape all right just love the eastman octave answered that one fancy some jacob slurs did that what do you think about northfield mandolins i've never played one I don't think. Maybe I've played one, but I don't have a strong memory of it. I've only heard good things. I, I, I've, you know, I don't have much experience myself, but uh, everything. I've, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about them, so I hope to get to play one someday. Sorry, I can't be of more use with instrument-specific stuff like that. Mandolin Cafe is a great place to go. You know, everybody has their own idea, but you might as well just. You know, say, hey, or search the cafe forum and see what everybody has to say. Get out and try to play one if you can. Douglas says, moving out of the first position, seventh fret. Okay, did that. Oh, wait, well, that was sort of connected to the seventh fret pinky question. Um, so, yeah, once you once you have that scale and the, or the FFCP... Uh, then you can move that anywhere because it doesn't use any open strings. So take that same closed A scale, move it up the fretboard, and you're above the seventh fret now. And then with FFCP, there's other versions where you start with different fingers. So like start. One of my favorite things for real fretboard mapping is use the D scale, start on the seventh fret of the G string every time but start the scale with every finger. So you, let's start with the pinky just to get it out of the way. We've got, uh, my camera's not quite in the right position. Here we go. Excuse me for a moment. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully that's a little better. All right, uh, that'll do. So, what was I saying? Oh yeah, 7th fret, D on the G string. Start with your pinky and find that whole scale without having to shift your hand around. So there's a D scale, starting with your pinky. Next up, use your ring finger. Woo! <laughs> And then use your middle finger. And then use your pointer finger. All those scales sound exactly the same, but you're using, starting with a different finger, which sort of gets your hand into a different position. Um, and that really can help open up the upper fretboard for you. Uh, in terms of a difficult passage, what's your advice? Go slow, yes, repeat it, yes, uh, slow build, but I'm curious what other techniques or overviews you might have. So yeah, if you run into a, a tricky passage in a tune that you're having trouble with, you know, I, everything that you said right there, uh, go slow, repeat it, 
um, build it up slowly. I think that's really the main things. You know, I'll use the tune um, Harvest Home as an example because it's got a classically tricky little section. So it's a Irish horn pipe. It sounds like this. It's going along. Then it does this. This sort of like triplet run. Super fun. But you know, you say, okay. Uh, going along, this is fine. Then you get to this. Kind of triplet thing. A big thing that can help is, you know, first break that section out. Get it under your fingers. Get it to a place where you can play it comfortably at, you know, some kind of tempo. It doesn't need to be fast, but get it so you can play it kind of in tempo, in time. And then, you know, once you've got it to a place where you're not rushing it, but it's comfortable, then put it back into the tune, but make sure to play everything around it slower so that you can then get that piece into the tune. So, you know, so rather than going... You know, that's just like taking that slow spot. It doesn't work that way. So, uh, you gotta keep tempo, so start with that part. Then, slow everything else around it down. Play with a metronome so you don't find yourself speeding up. That's gonna be super helpful. And that's an extreme example because it's a fairly slow tune with an exceptionally fast little flourish in the middle. Um, so usually you don't have to kind of slow things down that much. Just get the hard part to a good tempo and a good time feel where you feel comfortable with it and then build it back in, in time. So slow everything else around it down. Um, and other than that, you know, uh, often if it's a weird, um, a weird kind of, uh, syncopation or just kind of a strange collection of rhythms, I'll clap it out. So, like, you take a, a Grub Springs is a great example. It's fairly straight ahead old time tune. And you get this phrase coming up. which is kind of syncopated. So I, I like to, to like say, oh, that's really kind of giving me trouble. You gotta figure out the pick direction is a big part of it. And also just get used to that time. So you're kind of clapping along. I'll take it out of kind of the pick out of the hands turn it into a, a clapping exercise dum da deedle doodle deedle dee dum 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 da deedle doo deedle dee dum 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 da deedle 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 dee dum dee dum 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 da dum 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 and kind of repeat it like that you can slow it down if you need to um, but kind of getting it into clapping and so you're kind of singing the melody or humming the melody to some extent. Dum 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 can really help you kind of get that weird syncopation into your hands. There's a couple ideas. Oh, as Pat says, fun to see you in David's stream. It's always fun to to hang out with a bunch of mandolin players. So he's doing a, a great thing over there. Check out David Benedict's channel and Patreon and all that if you're not familiar. Yeah, so Alex says, I struggle with jigs in sessions. There's no room to pull it back if you make a mistake. Yeah, it definitely, I think that's something you can also practice. It is, you know, it can be, I think whatever you're uncomfortable with, you know, you get to the place where it's, it's hard to kind of find your way back once you've made a mistake. But I think getting comfortable with that idea and then, you know, I think it's a, a skill and a practice unto itself to learn to kind of get back on the, train or back on the tracks once you've fallen off um kind of in as smooth and kind of expedited a man uh way as possible so you know you're like 
at first you like, oh, you, you stumble and it's like, okay, well, everybody's kind of going on without me, which is a great reason to play along with recordings or in a session because, um, you know, often the session or the recording will definitely just keep going. You know, they're not going to stumble with you. So kind of let the session run along or the recording run along. And, you know, maybe it's like you, you make a stumble and it's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll start back up when that A part comes back around. You get back to the A, you jump back on the train. And then you can say, well, okay, I could also just, you know, I've stumbled, get myself together, let's start on the B part. Um, or you could say, okay, I stumbled halfway through the A, I'm going to get back on, on the second A. Or that little phrase always gives me trouble, but then there's this little part right after it that I can, I know I can do. And so you sort of shorten the amount of time you have to wait and collect yourself and then jump back in. And then you can sort of do that within a couple notes once you've been practicing for a while. And it's, it's a good skill to work on to kind of get back on track. It's a little bit of a mind game where you need to, uh, you know, you need to make a mistake and then be like, oh, made a mistake, no problem. And then get back in rather than like making a mistake and be like, oh man, I messed it up, now I gotta do that. Because that's just gonna take more time. Nobody cares as much as you uh, about a mistake that you make. That goes for everyone playing. You know, all of our mistakes sound louder and more disastrous to ourselves than they do to other people. Everybody makes mistakes. You just gotta jump back on the train or get back on the horse, however you want to think about it. James says, working on bow directions for the fiddle. Yeah, that is a dark art to me. <laughs> Great, glad you glad you're on the fiddle train. That's a very cool instrument. I wish I played a little fiddle. Yeah, so so the six yeah, you don't run into a whole lot of six eight tunes or jigs in old time music. Um but there there are some really kinda out there old time tunes that are jigs. Um, but it's, it's very uncommon. Um, but all Irish music, most Irish music kind of comes from, sorry, most old time music kind of comes from Irish and Scottish, um, heritage. So it's all kind of related. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a huge bluegrass guy, but thanks for sticking around. Mike says he's looking for bluegrass. Do you ever use an F-style mandolin? Is there a particular, is it their particular sound? I do, I have, I don't have an F5. I do have an F2, so an oval hole F-style mandolin. It's just a different thing. Um, you know, I personally, I'm, like, I'm a, more of an A-style player myself. I, you know, I kind of got into A-styles because generally they're about half the cost as a um, equivalent F-style. You know, if you, you find an A, uh, like a builder, you know, like, so my Ellis, for example, is, um, you know, the, his Tom's F-styles are, a, I think they're like... The A styles cost, I think, 60% of what the F style cost, and it's, you know, not uncommon. There's a whole lot more work, you know? There's all this carving, all the block work, all the headstock. The, you got to bind it all. It's a, a whole different ball game. Um, so they end up being more expensive instruments. And there's also a little... They do have a, a slightly different sound, but uh, not as much as you might think. You know, it's not like, oh, that really sounds like an F style. You know, do some blind taste tests. And I, I don't know that you'd be able to figure out uh, which is the A and which is the F. You know, the bigger things that make the difference is like the overall quality of the instrument um, and the, you know, the sound hole, how it's built, how old it is, what woods are used, what strings, how well it's set up, all that sort of stuff. Um, but they are, they are beautiful and that's uh, something to be said. And you know, if Having a beautiful instrument uh, means something to you, which it does to me as well, totally. I think it's just not for me about kind of the F style uh, specifically. But if that's going to make you like want to play the instrument more, by all means, get into it. 
There's a little bit of difference in sound just from, you know, you've got, it's a different volume of instrument. You've got different, like, you have these little blocks here inside the instrument in the scroll and the points that add a little mass in some slightly different places, a slightly different volume. You know, the headstock's going to weigh a little different. Um, some of those different weights adjust the sound a little bit, but it's not, you know, I think there are other ways to get a, a more varied sound than going from an A style F hole to an F style F hole of the same quality and maker and things like that. Cool, glad you like that tip about slowing everything down around a hard section. Yeah, it seems like I, it seems like Lewis has a buddy, he's got a Northfield. They seem great. Pinky position. Broke my pinky, so don't find it comfy to curl it. Is fleshy position acceptable? Totally, you know? Don't let, like, proper technique get in the way of you having a good t time. Try it, you know? Like, the stuff I say or anyone says about technique, it's what works for us. It's what works if someone's been teaching a long time. Like, I've been teaching for over 10 years now, and I've seen a lot of people play a lot of instruments and you know whatever works for you know I've I teach what works for most people but if you you know have broken a, a finger or um you know people who have like, I've taught people who have, like cut parts of their fingers off with band saws which I hope that never happens to anyone but it happens and uh you gotta adjust so you know if you physically are incapable of doing you know what I'm teaching make it work you know there's like, don't let proper technique get in the way of you having a good time. Are the scrolls on an F-style solid? The cavities of an A and F are very similar. They are, yeah. So most most of the scroll is usually solid. The points are usually solid. I've seen some exceptions. but So the, the volumes are very similar. But, the, you know, the, the weight to volume ratio is different because you have these solid blocks you know so it's the same volume but an f style is going to be heavier which is going to affect the sound yeah there is so mike is saying the same thing have some of both very little difference in sound but a little in an f style and a style it's hard you know i would love to do a comparison between the two you know but i don't have you really need like an instrument that's the same maker, the same age, the same amount of playing, the same setup. It needs to be so dialed in to actually do a comparison between like an A style and an F style. You know, like I've got a lot of metal in. <laughs> so I've got, this is my other oval hole. Also old, also Gibson, but this is from 1913. This is from 1924 and the construction is very different. Um, you know, that's ten over ten years of uh, change, and they sound very different. But these are still both oval holes. So you know, you got like just a quick little sound example. Very kind of bell-like. Uh, not a whole lot of bass on that one, but very ringing, very pure sounding. Um, and this one is much more well. This one's louder, it's got more bass to it. It's not quite as well defined in like that range. That's just very clear on this instrument. You know, even between old oval hole Gibsons that are about a hundred years old, there's a ton of difference. And, you know, it depends on how much one of these things has been played over the other and how it's set up and all that sort of stuff. Croc 4x4 says, Hello from Scotland. Never been musical, but decided to have a go with mandolin about 18 months ago. Glad you're enjoying the lessons. Cool. Yeah, it's never too late to, to jump into it, you know, just 
if everybody's a lot more musical than they think. Um, you know, we all spend our lives, even if we don't play, just like hearing music, getting a sense of like what we like to listen to or, you know, what kind of music we're surrounded by. So we're all musical in one way or another. And a lot of that, um, you know, it takes time, but you can express that with any instrument you choose if you just stick with it a little at a time. Tim has a question that I get often, which is about key signatures and um, sort of stated keys. So he says, uh, you play Swallowtail Jig in E Dorian, but the sheet music I have is in D major. What's the difference? So E Dorian, let's look at the notes of an E Dorian scale. We have E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, E. So they're all natural except for the F sharp and the C sharp. So um, there's a lot of minor scales. So you could have E, F sharp, G, A, B, B flat. Oh, sorry. B, C, D, E. But that's not what this tune is in. You know, you just play through the tune. Uh, no, that's not the tune. So that right there, got that C sharp. So we have F sharps and C sharps. So when you go to put that in a time si or a key signature in music, you write, you know, you have the little treble clef, and then you have a sharp next to F. You, you have a sharp in the F column, or row, and then a sharp in the C row, making all your Cs and Fs sharp. So even though that's most commonly um, D, you know, you'll see something like that and say, oh, D has D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. D major has C sharps and F sharps. F sharps and C sharps, um, and so does E Dorian. They they share the same scale. So E Dorian is kind of the same as playing a D scale, but starting and ending on E. So D scale is O two four five O two four five, and then just hit the open E just because, and then back down five four two O five four two O, and E Dorian is two four five O two four five O. So it looks like uh, E. So E Dorian will look like D major. Uh, a good kind of example of figuring out what key something is in is look at the last note of the tune. So this is the B part. Didn't quite play that right, but the end of the tune ends on E. That's usually a pretty good. Uh, way to figure out like where the tonal center of a tune is. I get that question a lot uh, Common misconception, but just because something looks like it's in D major if it doesn't end on a D major um, It might have the same sharps and flats as a D major scale, but just be a different tonal center like E Oh, nice. Mike's got a F Sam Bush uh, Gibson. Those are very cool. Oh, nice. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Also was answering that question. So, yeah, you can kind of get that. Oh, also, thank you for the super chat, both from Robert and Andrew. Really appreciate it. Uh, there's a couple ways to support the site. There's the super chat here. There's some links in the description. There's a bunch of folks here from Patreon. I uh, really appreciate the support over there. We can also get patron-only live streams, which is fun. And uh, you can also get lessons day early. There's also just a simple PayPal donation, things like that. All the links are in the description. Cool. Glad you're enjoying the uh, play-along jams. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of those lately. They're super fun and people seem to like them. Glad you're enjoying them, Andy. How do you change 
from the B minor to the F sharp minor chord. Oh, there's lots of different ways. Um, uh, just kind of to throw some fingers down on the fretboard right away. I like this B minor. Four, four, five. Uh, and then don't play the E string. Or if you really want a fourth string chord, you can do four, four, five, seven. Uh, and then you need an F, but a, little, a lot of times I'll just play three string chords. And then you need an F sharp. So if, if somebody said like play B minor to F sharp minor, I would probably do this. Which is four, four, five to six, four open. Never playing the E string. But if you want full chords on all four strings, you can do this B minor, four, four, five, seven to five, sorry, six, four, open two. Or if you want to keep this kind of bar shape, you can go B minor, then just like you go from G to C, you can go B minor to E minor, four, five, seven, and then up two frets, six, seven, nine. And there's your F sharp minor. Lots of options. Uh, if you really want to dig into like why chords are where they are, uh, a little bit of theory will help you out. I've got some lessons for that on my website. But uh, you know, just a simple throw some fingers down, four, four, five to six, four open and never play the E string. Yes, James says, have you seen the Carter's video of the 1890s Orville Gibson? Yeah. Carter's Vintage Guitars has an awesome YouTube channel where uh, Walter's been doing some amazing kind of history of really old instruments. If you're into old instruments, check that out. Very cool. All right, <laughs> I got a request for a Bitcoin. I don't, I don't have a, maybe I'll, maybe I'll look into that. I don't know anything about Bitcoin really, so, but it could be fun. Uh... Let's see, can we jam along to Road to Liz Dune Varna? I think, let's keep that in mind. I'll, let me look. I've done a lot of these and this week's jam along, which is gonna happen in five or 10 minutes here is Shebeg Shamor, great O'Carolyn tune. But I can also look through some excellent uh, resources that Denise puts together, who is here in the chat and can see if we've done the road to Liz Dune Varna before. Maybe somebody can even beat me to this because I'm not the fastest at looking at all this, but let's find out real quick. And I can just point you to one where we did a road to Liz Dune Varna. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be able to come up with it. What's going on here? Denise has excellent things, but I can never find them myself. There we go. Oh, come on. All right, here we go. Road to Liz Dunvarna. I should just make this public. We have not done Road to Liz Dunvarna, so let's do that one next week. Um... um let's, yeah, let's do Road to Liz Dunvarna next week. It's always good to figure one out and that's a great tune that a lot of people know so next week before we even get to this week usually we pick it at the end but Road to Liz Dune Varna great one Eastman's are great uh, another way to think about the key signature problem is to look at the chord progressions yeah that also is true you know you look at it says it's in Road to Liz Dune Varna or what was it uh, Swallowtail Jig is in says it, uh, the key signature looks like D but it starts out E minor then D Minor, and then and it always ends D E minor and if it ends on an E minor it probably is in E minor rather than D not always but uh 99% of the time especially in the tunes on my website it's a great point James thank you Edward for the super chat 
Really appreciate it. Great to see you here every week. Still got that tenor guitar. I do have a number of tenor guitars. I don't know which one in particular you're talking about, but I love tenor guitars. <laughs> yep, Mando bass. Definitely check out uh, the Carter Vintage Instrument YouTube channel if you're into old instruments. They, they got a lot of cool stuff. Anybody know any good DIY luthier websites? My neck looks like it's starting to separate at the heel. Yikes. Uh, ben, that is a question for Benjamin Foss. If you're in the chat, <laughs> SOS to Ben Foss. Um, you know, there are YouTube channels about Luthery. I've never watched too many of them. Um, there is a builder and repair section on the Mandolin Cafe forum that could maybe help you. Is it, is it too late to start learning mandolin at 15? Not at all. I have taught people who are in their 80s who are just picking up a mandolin. Um, you know, as long as you're having fun, that's great. I, I started when I was like 12, so you're only <laughs> three years behind me. Uh, if, if, it's, if you're 15, you got plenty of time. Just jump into it and start having fun. It's so much fun. Isabella's Lullaby. I don't know that one. Thanks, Uncle Bobby, for the super chat. Yep, we've got people in the chat coming through with starting at 60, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, never never too late, but uh, no time like the present. At the same, maybe those are the two ways to sum it up. Signing up to a part-time luthier course in London. Cool. Awesome. Melinda is six months in as a newbie and starting at 72. So cool. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to make sure I didn't lose any. It's great to see everybody when they started. You know, it really, if you're having fun, it, number one thing about... You know, any of this stuff behind me is about having fun. You know, if you're having fun doing what you're doing, you're doing it right. <laughs> um, I'm going to make sure I didn't miss any last things, and then we can get into the Shebeg Shamor play-along jam. I should turn off that blooping. Awesome. Cheers from Moscow. Good to have you here. Yeah, it's uh, if you want to learn something, it's a great time to do it because there's a lot of information on the internet. That's kind of that's how I learned. Uh, there wasn't nearly as much as there is now, but when I started around the year 2000, I learned most of what I know from or what I knew from uh, going on Mandolin Cafe and finding the what little I could on YouTube, and uh, and then finding folks around me that were playing and. Uh, learning some tunes and just kind of start going to fiddle camps, all that sort of stuff. All right, so let's play. All right, Ben is here with the, some thoughts on the neck problems on that mandolin. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so let's do a little bit of Shebeg Shemor. Lovely tune. I'm gonna, I don't know what I put in for, this tune's got some variable chords, so I'm just gonna make sure I'm playing what I got on the website. If you n don't know this tune, just see what you can pick up as we go along. There are tabs and uh, standard notation on my website. But also, great to just, you know, play around. And there's also, of course, the tune lesson where I just teach it by ear. Um, but it's a good way to just uh, kind of, also good to just, you know, start in on it and see what happens. So pick up what you can on the fly. It's great practice, even if you don't get all of it. If you know the tune, great work, great time to just kind of really get it under your fingers. If you've been playing Shebeg Shemore for years... See if you can spice it up a little with some double stops or some tremolo or some melodic variation, chord substitutions, you name it. Whatever you do, just make some sound along with me here. 
as we play a shebang shamor to waltz in the key of D. I'll start out by playing the melody, and then you play the chords behind me, or play the melody along with me, and then at some point I'll switch over to the chords, and you play melody, and just kind of challenge yourself wherever you're at. Here we go. A2. B2. You take it. Here we go. A2. Might have got a little mixed up there. <laughs> Sorry about that. B. So I'll play the second B together. Bake some more. Lovely tune. Yeah, kind of.
kind of a bit to spell, <laughs> but it seems like people are already in it on the chat. Glad to see it. I will uh, catch up with the chat. Seems like I missed some good stuff. All right, John's just starting out. Happy birthday. That means he'll be playing GC and D. I was playing GC and D for, oop, I'm still on that screen. Uh, David is saying, uh, if it wasn't for Mando Lessons, I'd be playing GC and D in an eternal loop. That was pretty much the story of my life for the first, like, three years that I was playing. <laughs> nice. Sasha's thinking about a mandolin on her birthday. I think that's a great idea. The tune... Oh, yeah, okay. So now we got... She begs you more. That is the correct spelling. People actually spell it a million different ways, but James uh, has it down. Is how I spell it anyway. Cool. Sasha has a great question. Is mandolin harder than guitar? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's easier. Um, I tried to play, I remember in school, I got a guitar, like, in, when I was in, like, third or fourth grade, somebody put a guitar in my hands in school, and it was just like, yeah, here's a G chord, and it was like this big grip of fingers, and it was like, ah, oh, this is hard and uncomfortable, um, and with mandolin, you know, the first chords that you learn, there's two fingers, and once you get those three chords under your fingers you can play almost any song in the book so uh you know I, I find mandolin that's my my own personal thought is mandolin is easier than guitar it's a little you know you, you got to build up some calluses on your left hand because the strings are can be a little tight um hard to push down but uh that's my thought anyway i think it's a slight i think they both are can be lifelong instruments for sure uh you know there's always something new to learn but i think for a lot of people, mandolin is a little bit easier of a kind of entry point. William asks, where do I get the tab for that tune? Mandolessons.com. Look up the tune name. Shebeg Shemur. Uh, is one of the ways. Or, uh, eh, M-H-O-R or M-O-R-8. <laughs> There's they're kind of all different ways of spelling it, but... Look up B E A G on my website, and you'll you'll find it. You search, just use the search. Um, and the tablature, standard notation, chords to play along with, play along tracks, the lesson where I teach it by ear, all of that can be found on my website. Oh, cool! Irish or Scottish Gaelic on Duolingo. That sounds great. I would love to speak Irish. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out. Next week, we will do Road to Lisdun Varna, a great slide. Um, often played as a jig, or kind of referred to as a jig, but it's actually a slide. Uh, check it out on my website. It's a tune that most people will know if you go to an Irish session, and probably even beyond that. So check that one out if you haven't already. Thank you all for hanging out uh, this week. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon just a quick plug i'm teaching at a mandolin workshop um at the end of march the 27th and 28th it's uh with it's david surrett organizes the march mandolin festival it's going to be a good time uh marla Fibish is also teaching a great irish mandolin mandolinist um and david is also teaching and his wife Susie is going to make some appearances and i love teaching at it in person and i hope you can all join me uh, for the virtual edition, it's usually in New Hampshire, but now it's just on the internet, so you can't beat the commute. Hope to see you all there, and yeah, see you all next weekend. Thanks you all for tuning in and chatting. Great to hear from you all, and keep picking 
and see you all in a week. Bye-bye.